At a funeral, people wept bitterly for their loved one. The ghost of the deceased, Tenma Otori, was there too, watching them mourn and cry for him. He thought it was a strange world where he could attend his own funeral as a ghost. He saw his grandparents, who had raised him, sobbing for him. He tried to reach out to them, to comfort them, but he soon realized they could not see or hear him. He felt helpless and sat down at his funeral, unable to console them. Then, someone showed up, claiming to be a god. He had a big, cheerful smile and offered Tenma a chance to come to his world. Tenma's appearance changed instantly and he was freaked out. He asked who the new guy was and why he was dressed like that. The new guy told him to calm down and said he was not a weirdo. He asked Tenma to listen to him. After Tenma calmed down, the floating being said he was a god from another world and he had come to recruit him by collecting his soul. He said he wanted to reincarnate Tenma so that he could save his world. He said he needed souls with rich life forces, which meant souls that could interact with the world even without physical bodies, like Tenma. He asked Tenma to accept his offer and said he would bestow special powers on him. He said Tenma would retain his memories. Tenma looked at the new guy with a suspicious eye. The new guy hopped on his shoulder and begged him to accept his offer. Tenma was still reluctant, and the god tried to persuade him by saying he would use magic to grant Tenma one wish for the world he was leaving behind. Tenma liked the idea and agreed to accept the god's offer. When asked about his wish, he said he wanted his memories to slowly fade away from his grandparents. This shocked the god, and he asked why Tenma would wish for that. Tenma said it was simple. He loved them. He asked if the god could fulfill his request. The god said he could do better by completely erasing Tenma from his grandparents' memories. Tenma said no to that. He said it would make him very sad if his grandparents forgot him completely. This made the god emotional, and tears filled his eyes. As they were still at the funeral, Tenma's grandparents told him to live long for them and that he must be smiling in heaven. They left the funeral, and soon other new people arrived. They asked Tenma if he was ready for reincarnation, saying that they were the gods who were moved by his story. They said that Tenma was the first one to ever receive power from so many gods. The first god who had persuaded Tenma to join his world welcomed him and praised him to his fellow gods. He said that he had finally picked a good one. He introduced himself as Phantasma, the god of creation. He wished Tenma a good night and a happy second life. He asked him if he was ready to be reborn. Tenma replied, yes and good night. After Tenma disappeared from their presence, Phantasma asked his fellow gods if they had not overpowered Tenma. He said that they had given him the strongest class and the protection of all the gods. He wondered how strong Tenma would become. He said that maybe he would be strong enough to kill even them, the gods. And so, Tenma was reincarnated into another world as a baby alone in the forest, covered in a sheet. There were goblins in the forest where the baby was. One of them saw the baby and approached it saying, yummy. Baby Tenma was disappointed and helpless. He thought that this was not what he had in mind when he accepted the reincarnation offer. Ten years later, Tenma was sparring with his grandfather, who was known as Merlin, in both combat and magic. Tenma declared that he would defeat his grandfather today, and his grandfather accepted his challenge, telling him to give his best shot. His father and mother watched them train from a safe distance. His father was proud that his son was learning from his grandfather, while his mother was worried that they were training too hard. Tenma suddenly spaced out, remembering his past. He had been reborn in this world, but he was abandoned and almost eaten by goblins. A kind couple rescued him and raised him as their own. He still had memories from his previous life, but he was happy with his second chance. One day, he brought home a slime that he had tamed, and his grandfather was amazed. He said that Tenma was a genius and that he would train him to be a master adventurer. Tenma smiled, thinking that it was only possible because of the power that God had given him. His parents joined them and celebrated his achievement. He thought that they were all his precious family, even though they were not his biological parents. His father snapped him out of his trance, telling him to focus. His grandfather was surprised to see a wall of stone rise up in front of him. It was a surprise attack from Tenma, who said that his grandfather was not paying attention. His grandfather tried to break the wall, but Tenma quickly knocked his hat off with magic. His grandfather admitted defeat and praised Tenma for his quick thinking. He said that he would keep his promise and let Tenma enter the Elder Forest, where there were Rank A monsters. The deal was that Tenma had to win a spar against him first. He said that a promise was a promise. His father teased his grandfather, saying that his eyesight was too poor to see the ground. He patted Tenma's hair, 
congratulating him on his victory. His mother asked his father why he was interfering. She told Tenma that the Elder Forest was a scary place and that there were rumors of a fearsome beast that no one had ever seen before. She tried to discourage him from going there. His father argued that there were no rank A monsters near the entrance and that ordinary villagers often walked there. Tenma pleaded with his mother, saying that he had been looking forward to exploring the forest. He gave her his puppy eyes and she could not refuse him. She agreed to let him go but told him to come back right away if anything happened. Tenma agreed and walked into the forest. He thought that it was time to get revenge on the goblins that had attacked him when he was reborn. He used his spell float to fly in the air and navigate the forest. He went deeper into the forest, confident and curious. He also used his spell detect to scan his surroundings. His slime pet, Rocket, seemed uneasy. He asked him what was wrong, and then he saw large wild animals approaching them. He was ready to fight them, but then he realized that they were not attacking, but fleeing. As Tenma was walking in the forest, he saw two farir, rare beasts that usually lived far from the village. He wondered if the rumors of huge beasts in the forest were true. Suddenly, the farir launched an ice attack, but it missed Tenma. He realized that the Farir were not aiming at him, but at the dragon snakes that were chasing them. One of the Farir was injured and the other was pregnant. They were a mating pair and they were in danger. Tenma decided to help them as he knew that Farir were rank A monsters that could easily defeat rank B monsters like dragon snakes if they were not in a weakened state. He used his earth magic, but it failed because of the rain. He told the Farir to run away while he distracted the dragon snakes with his sword. The Farir used their ice magic to freeze the raindrops and create a cover. They ran to a nearby tree where the female fairy went into labor. The male fairy stayed behind to fight off the dragon snakes. Tenma followed them and saw the female fairy give birth to a cub before dying. He picked up the cub and went to check on the male fairy, but he was also dead. Tenma took the cub home and named it Shiro. He told it that he would be its family now, he was glad that the fluffy cub was safe. He gave it some milk and promised to take care of it. Tenma had a hard time taking care of the baby Farir he named Shiro. The next day, he found Shiro chewing on his bedsheet and begged him to stop. He wondered how different Shiro was from the regular animals he had seen in his previous life. Shiro suddenly jumped on him with full force, knocking him to the ground. Luckily, Rocket, the slime pet, acted as a cushion for his head and prevented him from getting hurt. He smiled and thanked Rocket, while thinking that he sometimes forgot how light he was since he was only 10 years old. Phantasma had three continents, and the biggest one was called Ullens. It consisted of the Kingdom of Craston, the Principality of Hangul, and the Republic of Gilst. Tenma lived in Kukuri Village, which belonged to the Kingdom of Craston. Next to the village was the Elder Forest, a mostly unexplored area that was considered a Rank A dungeon. It was said that there were no dangerous monsters near its entrance, but recent events proved otherwise. Rank A and B monsters, such as Fenrirs and Dragon Snakes, were roaming around. Ricardo and Merlin, the village elders, saw this as a bad omen and contacted Margrave Haust, the governor of Kukuri Village, asking him to send a scouting party. Meanwhile, Tenma was reading a book called All About Monsters, hoping to learn more about how to take care of Shiro. He realized that Shiro was very different from the dog his neighbor had in his previous life. Shiro already had teeth after a week, while dogs took three weeks to grow them. Shiro also looked very hungry and eager for meat, while Tenma had only fed him milk for a week. He thought that maybe he could hide his torn bedsheet under some slime from his mom. As he was thinking this, his mom came in and told him that his dad wanted to talk to him. He was surprised that his mom didn't seem angry about the bedsheet and said that it was normal for Shiro to do that since he was just a baby. After his mom left, he told Shiro that he needed to train him properly. He then went to see his dad, who told him that it was time to butcher some magic beasts. Tenma was excited about this. He had put the magic beasts in his dad's bag so that they wouldn't cause trouble. A magic bag used time-space magic to enlarge the interior and hold a large number of items. Since time was frozen in the bag, living creatures couldn't be put inside. His dad's common tier magic bag could hold 600 kilograms worth of stuff. Higher-tiered bags were very rare. This time, Tenma had gotten his hands on six dragon snakes weighing 2,000 kilograms. Normally, these beasts wouldn't fit, but Tenma had brought them home in a special dimension bag of his own design. Unlike a magic bag, time didn't stop inside, so it wasn't suitable for transporting raw meat. 
but it was handy for transporting lots of things and then preserving them in a magic bag. Tenma's dimensional bag was special because it was made from an original recipe and had a huge capacity of 50 square meters. It could fit all sorts of things inside, even humans. To prevent it from being used for war or a coup d'etat if it fell into the wrong hands, he protected it with a strong password after asking his grandfather for advice. Tenma, his father, Ricardo, and his grandfather, Merlin, began to butcher the dragon beasts. They removed their magic cores, cut off their heads, extracted their fangs with caution for the venom glands, skinned them, and separated the bones from the organs. Tenma fed some meat to Shiro. Tenma looked sad after they finished butchering. His father asked him what was wrong. He asked if they really had to butcher the farrier corpses since they were Shiro's parents. He said he had planned a proper burial for them. His father told him that they had to because the corpses of powerful magical beasts could be used for evil and that they could come back as undead monsters. He said that this knowledge was common sense. He patted his son and said that his way of thinking was strange, but kind. He said that Tenma had a different perspective on things and that he never lost sight of what was important. He said that he was a proud father. Ricardo said that Shiro's parents fought bravely with honor and that he did not want them to suffer even after death. They went back home and his mother welcomed them. Tenma was excited and told his mother that they got a lot of loot and that they sold the extra dragon snake to the caravan. He said that he was tired and that he would sleep well that night. Then he remembered that his bedsheet was completely ruined. His mother snapped him out of his thoughts by calling his name and handing him something. Tenma asked what it was. She said that it was a new fur bedding made for him from the skin of Shiro's parents. She said that she was sure that Shiro's parents would want to be near their son. The next day, Tenma and his family were seen selling the cooked acquire meat. The area looked like a festival because the caravan had spread the rumors about the great beast. Ricardo announced to his family over dinner that a circus group was coming to town and that they would be staying at their house. He added that Tenma might find a playmate among them. Tenma was excited to hear about the circus, as he had never visited one in his previous life. He eagerly awaited the circus performance and meeting the circus team, who would be in their village for a while. The day arrived, and the circus amazed the audience with various tricks, from dazzling magic to ball balancing. Tenma watched them and recalled his former world where magic did not exist and where the tricks would have been impressive. But in the current world where magic was real, the circus tricks and card tricks seemed lame to Tenma. After their performance, the circus team lodged at Tenma's house and expressed their gratitude to his parents for their hospitality. The girls complimented Tenma on his cuteness and his skill in helping them set up. They invited him to join their show, but Tenma declined. When they left, they said they had a wonderful time in the village and that Tenma would always be cute in their eyes. They bid farewell as they departed. Tenma was enthusiastically serving customers at their food stall, taking orders for their specialty, grilled, deep-fried dragon snake steak and soup. He found joy in his work, often expressing gratitude to his customers. His confidence in his cooking skills stemmed from his past, where he was responsible for preparing meals for his grandfather and himself, as he had no parents. Their food stall, managed by Tenma and his mother, quickly gained a good reputation. Customers were particularly fond of the steak prepared by Tenma, with his mother commenting on its deliciousness. The sale of dragon snake meat was a huge success, not only for its exceptional taste, but also for the belief that consuming high-level beasts brings luck. This venture brought them a profit of 100,000, covering the village's expenses for many years. One day, a customer recognized Tenma's grandfather, Merlin, and asked what an adventurer of his caliber was doing in such a town. Merlin replied that he was hunting for rare materials. After the customer left, Merlin boasted about being a star adventurer. Tenma and Merlin tried to persuade Ricardo to share his past adventures. Tenma was genuinely curious, but Merlin seemed to be teasing Ricardo. As Merlin attempted to share Ricardo's story, Ricardo resisted, leading to a playful back and forth between them. This attracted the attention of some customers who recognized Merlin and Ricardo as great adventurers, causing excitement among the crowd. After the crowd dispersed, Tenma suggested that his father and Merlin reconcile. Merlin, however, dismissed the idea, stating that he now had his grandson as his companion. Tenma's mother then called him to help with lunch. During their conversation, Tenma learned that his mother and Merlin used to be formidable adventurers. She assured him that she, his father, and his grandfather would always be there for him. 
Trouble arose when some men accused Tenma of deceiving them, claiming that the meat he sold was not from a magical beast. Shiro growled at them in an attempt to protect Tenma, but it was Ricardo's intimidating glare that scared them away. This incident led Tenma to realize that there will always be unreasonable adults, regardless of the era. After running away from Ricardo, who had scared them, the three men cursed him among themselves. They called him an old geezer from the countryside who was full of himself. They wondered how they could get revenge on him, saying that they wished they could blow him away in one blast, or maybe kill his son. As they were talking, a beast man appeared behind them and called them bastards. He asked them who they were talking about. The men were terrified by his sudden appearance and felt like jumping out of their skin. The beast man noticed their fear and mocked them. He held a knife in his hand and said that he would help them with their plan. He asked them if they agreed to his offer or if they preferred to die. The men's faces showed horror as he slashed the neck of one of them. Then he asked the remaining two what their answer was. The next night, a wolf invaded the village. Ricardo and Celia, Tenma's parents, were summoned to join the defense. Tenma wanted to go with them, but his father told him to stay at home. He said that Merlin, their leader, had not returned yet. And if something had happened to him, Tenma would have to look after him. Tenma thought they were too protective of him because of the dragon snake incident. His father added that there were at least 10 wolves and that they could either kill them or scare them away. He said that they had enough people to handle the wolves, even without Merlin. His parents waved goodbye and told him to take care of the house as they left. Tenma heard the wolves howling and felt a chill. He wondered if the wolves were communicating with something else. He told Shiro, his pet, to hide in his magic bag. He sensed that something was wrong he used his search magic to expand his range and monitor the wolves and his parents. He noticed that the wolves moved in a strange way, similar to his father's team. He doubted that the wolves could coordinate so well. He also sensed that some people were approaching his house. He assumed that they were the patrol group from the village. He wondered what they wanted from him. Then his door was smashed open. He was shocked to see the same men that his father had chased away for causing trouble with their food. He asked them why they had their weapons drawn if they were not there to help fight the wolves. He guessed that they were seeking revenge on his father, who had humiliated them by targeting his son. He thought that they were foolish and doomed for underestimating his power. He said that they were failures as adventurers. He used his magic to knock out two of them. He used his detection magic to check if there were any wolves outside. He did not relax his guard. Then three more people entered. They were beast men, and one of them was their leader and the mastermind. He was huge and muscular. He laughed loudly and praised Tenma for his performance. He said that the two men that Tenma had defeated were idiots. He said that he had only used them as a distraction. He said that he had planned to get rid of them along with any evidence. Tenma stared at the three beast men with fear. He thought that they were bad news. He drew his sword and prepared to attack them. He ran towards them with speed. He realized that they were after Shiro, who was in his bag. Using his flash magic, Tenma retreated and vanished from the beast men's sight. They wondered where he had run off to. It was a rainy night, so their noses could not track him down. Tenma hid and watched them from a distance. He thought to himself that his blinding technique did not work on the beast men, so he had to hide for some time. He also thought that if he used his blinding technique again, someone in the village might see the light and come to help. But he decided that it was a bad idea because the beast men were ruthless and would kill anyone who came running. He told himself that he had to get rid of the beast men quickly. But then his body went numb and he felt terrified. He realized that it was the effect of the poison from the knife that had cut him when they attacked. One of the beast men said that the poison had finally kicked in and demanded Tenma to hand over his bag. Tenma resisted, but he could not do much with his numb body. One of the beast men kicked him in the belly and said that he should not be so cocky over a dog in the bag, not knowing that it was a baby farrier. Then the beast man took out his knife and was ready to hurt Tenma. Tenma sat on the edge of a hill, enjoying the nice weather as he fished with Shiro and Rocket by his side. Shiro had no choice but to come along, since Tenma's mom always kicked him out of the kitchen whenever she cooked dinner. She said it would be good for Shiro to play outside, but Tenma knew she just wanted him to stop running around her feet. Tenma decided to make the best of it and vowed to catch a big fish to impress her. He thought about using a magical shockwave, but he remembered how he had messed up last time and blasted all the fish out of the water. Controlling magic was hard and Tenma was still learning. 
As he was lost in his thoughts, his fishing rod suddenly jerked. He had hooked a big fish! He jumped up in excitement and pulled the fish out of the water with all his strength. He didn't know that the fish had just been reincarnated and had a story of its own. He proudly carried the fish home, hoping to win his mom's approval. Tenma realized that the last beast man was not joking around, so he had to act fast if he wanted to survive. He grabbed his knife and sliced off part of his hand that had been wounded by the poisoned blade, hoping to stop the venom from spreading. He felt some of the poison leave his system, giving him a brief window of mobility. He seized the opportunity and launched a surprise attack, using his full strength to sever the beast man's arm. Then, he used his magic to unleash an air bullet, a technique that compressed air and shot it as a weapon at high speed. The air bullet hit the beast man's head, blowing it off and killing him instantly. Tenma muttered that the beast man was too slow, as he had said earlier. He looked at his hands, which he had used to fire the air bullet. He thought to himself that he had tried the technique on a whim, and it turned out to be very useful. He also noticed that the technique consumed more mana than a blade attack. But since he could control it with his fingertips, it created more force and was easier to use. As he stood up, he suddenly felt weak and dizzy. He remembered that the poison was still in his system. He tried to walk, but he couldn't. He attempted to crawl, but he realized that his vision was blurry and his consciousness was fading. He thought to himself that life in this world was cheap and cruel. People killed and were killed all the time. He wondered what he had done to deserve this fate. He recalled that this was the first time he had ever killed someone. He told himself that it was okay to kill monsters, but he was unsure if it was okay to kill humans. He then reassured himself that he didn't need to worry about that because some humans were worse than monsters. He remembered how he had hesitated before finishing off one of the dying beast men. He told himself that there was no need for him to hesitate because he would lose everything that was precious to him if he didn't. He told himself that he might have been a demi-human, but his heart was all beast. That was why he had to kill him, because there were people who looked human but were more savage than beasts. He remembered how he had fought and defeated another beast man, and then faced the last one, who was the mastermind. He remembered how the mastermind had called his fallen beast men a bunch of idiots, and how he had mocked them by calling them fatty and dogface. He remembered how he had said that they were weak. He grabbed a bottle and gulped down its contents, which looked like medicine. He thought to himself that everything would work out in the end, since he wouldn't have to share the money anymore. Tenma felt a surge of emotion that he had never experienced before. He was determined to kill the last beast man. The beast man charged at him, but Tenma easily dodged his attacks. He had learned to predict the beast man's movements from sparring with his grandfather. He seized an opening and sliced off the beast man's hand. After a few more blows, Tenma finished him off. He felt victorious, but also weak. The poison had spread throughout his body and he had lost a lot of blood. He saw his parents rushing to the scene, saying how glad they were that he was safe and okay. His eyes sparkled with joy and excitement, but he couldn't hold on any longer. He started to fall, losing consciousness. His mother caught him before he hit the ground, asking him if he was okay. But the last beast man was not dead yet. He had somehow regenerated from the fatal wound on his head. He swore that he would kill the unconscious Tenma. Tenma's parents hugged him and told him to stay awake. Then they ran towards the beast man, ready to protect their son. They swiftly decapitated him with one swift motion. Tenma woke up in bed, shocked and bandaged. He saw Rocket and Shiro on one side, looking sad and waiting for him to wake up. On the other side, his mom, dad, and grandpa were there. As soon as Tenma opened his eyes, his mom, Chilia, hugged him and expressed her joy. He carefully removed his bandages. His parents asked him if he was all right and told him how worried they had been. He remembered how his parents had saved him by cutting off the beast man's head. His grandpa, Merlin, examined the severed head and noticed that it was still alive. Ricardo wondered how a normal human could survive that. Merlin said that the beast man had turned into a zombie and pointed to the bottle of medicine that he had swallowed. He speculated that the medicine was the cause of his transformation and said that they couldn't interrogate him. He said that he would be interested in studying him, but it would be safer to finish him off, Ricardo agreed. The men who had been defeated by Tenma confessed that they had teamed up with the adventurers and the beast man to get revenge on Ricardo. They also said that Candid and his men had gone after Shiro, 
also known as Shiromaru. They said that a guy had hired them to collect rare animal hides and paid them well. The guy who hired them was a Viscount named Razak. It was a noble who was behind it all. Merlin suggested that maybe the Margrave had instigated the Viscount. Ricardo asked if Celia would go after the Margrave's heart. She replied angrily that maybe she would if she caught him off guard. She said that he would pay for hurting Tenma. Ricardo pleaded with his wife to calm down and said that the Margrave had nothing to do with the Viscount. He said that the Viscount had no allies or factions. Merlin said that he was relieved to hear that. Ricardo said that it would be harder to get away with things when superiors were involved. Celia said that if she found out that a noble was involved, she would make sure to leave no traces. Then, a certain Viscount would disappear from the continent forever. Merlin examined the remains of the bottle that contained zombification. He wondered where the beast man had obtained it and decided to investigate it further. Two years later, Tenma had fully recovered and leveled up his skills. He often played with Shiro, fetching and catching bones. One day, he went to the forest and noticed that it was unusually noisy. He used his detection magic and sensed danger. A group of orcs, not ordinary ones, were attacking some humans. He hurried to the scene, putting Shiro and Rocket in his bag. He reached the carriage of a traveling party and saw a lady crying out that the orcs were overpowering them. Tenma jumped on the roof of the carriage and shouted that he was there to help. He thought that this was a great opportunity to test his training. He held some small pebbles in his hand and rolled them on the ground, summoning stone golems and monsters. He also used healing magic on the whole traveling party, creating a large healing ring. Everyone was amazed by Tenma's power. Then Tenma spotted something among the orcs. It was the Orc King, a huge creature wielding a giant axe. The Orc King made all the orcs around him stronger by his presence, giving each orc an A rank. Tenma told himself that it was not a problem for him. The party thanked him for his assistance and joined him in attacking the Orc King. After a few clashes of Tenma's knife and the Orc King's axe, Tenma sliced the Orc King in half from the waist. With the Orc King dead, the orcs lost their strength. Tenma then used his earth magic to create spikes of wood that pierced through the remaining orcs, using his earth needle technique. A man stepped forward and called Tenma a young hero, thanking him for saving them and preventing any casualties. Tenma replied that it was no big deal. He noticed that the man was wearing expensive clothes and decided to find out who he was. He thought that the man must be important and used his magic to identify him. The man turned out to be Alex von Blumer, 47 years old, a human of the royal class and the king of the kingdom of Craston. Tenma was shocked to realize that he had just saved the king. Tenma was shocked to see that the man standing before him was the king. The king approached them, but the guards tried to protect him. Using his authority, he told the guards to stand down and moved closer to Tenma. He asked him with a straight face how he knew he was the king. Tenma realized he had messed up. He couldn't reveal to the king that he had used magic to check his identity. He tried to get out of the mess he had created by saying that he recognized the king by his crest. He said that only royalty could use the crest of the wild boar and the dragon, and pointed to the carriage. He also said that he had heard that the king was pretty old. The king told him not to be nervous and praised him for being very educated. Tenma responded with a fake laugh and said he was glad none of them was hurt. He said he would be taking his leave now. He wanted to leave as soon as possible to avoid any further trouble. As he was leaving, the king told him to wait and put his hand on Tenma's shoulder. Tenma was terrified by the king's grin and said that his mom would be worried if he was not home soon. The king said that he was sure Tenma's mother would accept an explanation from the king. One of the guards told the king that he was scaring the kid. A girl in the party also told the king to calm down and called him sire. The king relaxed and introduced himself as Alex von Blumer Craston, the king of the country, to Tenma. One of the guards introduced himself as Kreef, the Grand Chamberlain, to the royal family. Another one introduced himself as Edgar and thanked Tenma for his help. Another one introduced himself as Jean J.B. and said that Tenma was a pretty tough kid. Another one introduced himself as Sigurd and apologized for drawing his sword against Tenma earlier. The girl in their party introduced herself as Chris and said it was nice to meet Tenma. She also thanked him for saving them and asked if he could do something about his golems. Tenma commanded the golems to stand down. Kreef said that Tenma's magic was impressive and asked for his name. Tenma deactivated the golems' magic and turned them back to pebbles. He then answered that he was Tenma 
and that he lived in the Kukuri village. The king's face lit up and said it was such a coincidence because their traveling party was heading to the village. They implored Tenma to enter the carriage and travel with them, but he tried to say no. He tried to fly home using float, but the king would not let him go. He said that it was ridiculous to refuse a ride in the royal carriage, which was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Tenma was not able to escape. As they traveled in the carriage, he asked the king why he was going to the Kukuri village. The king replied that rumors had reached the royal capital that something strange was happening in the Elder Forest. He said that he conducted a survey of Mangrove House's domain every 10 years and that he wanted to show the citizens how much he cared for them. Criff told Tenma that the king only came to the village as an excuse to relax and have some fun, but the king pretended not to hear him. Tenma wondered why the king didn't ask the Margrave to announce his visit, and the king said that would be too formal and burdensome for the Margrave. He said he preferred to drop by casually with a small group of companions and not have the Margrave's servants follow him around. Tenma was shocked and asked if the king could do whatever he wanted, and Criff said that was the privilege of being king. They soon arrived at Tenma's house, where Tenma saw the king and his father talking like old friends. He was surprised to learn that the king had been in an adventuring party with his parents and that they were quite famous for slaying a dragon. He noticed how the king and his father called each other by their first names. Then Tenma's mother appeared and scolded him for getting into trouble. The king tried to calm her down and asked her to forgive him, since he had saved them from danger. Then Merlin came and also asked her to spare the boy, saying that Tenma had acted bravely and confidently and deserved praise. The king greeted Merlin as his uncle and said it was a pleasure to see him again. He called him Master Merlin and said it had been a long time. Tenma asked why Merlin was so friendly with the king, and Criff explained that Merlin had been the king's personal tutor. He said the king was a naughty boy who made many tutors quit, but he always obeyed Merlin. He said Merlin taught him things like efficient torture methods or how to skip classes without getting caught. That night, as Tenma slept soundly in his room, the king asked his old friends Ricardo and Celia when they had a child. He said the child was extraordinary and asked Criff what he thought of him. Criff said that if it was a magic battle, even Sir Dean would be in danger against Tenma. The king was shocked because Dean was the captain of the royal guard and the strongest warrior in the kingdom. The king said he would love to have Tenma as his son's bodyguard and offered him a position in the royal guard. Celia said she was okay with it as long as Tenma agreed. She also said she was afraid that Tenma might run away if he found out that they were not his biological parents. Ricardo hugged her and told her not to worry saying that she was Tenma's mother, no matter what. Merlin agreed and said that it was obvious that Tenma loved her, because he was sad when she scolded him and happy when she praised him. He said that was the proof that Celia was his mother, and his words cheered her up. She said Merlin was right and went to sleep. They all went to bed, and the next day, as they ate breakfast, the king proposed again to Tenma to become his son's bodyguard and join the royal guard. Tenma politely declined, and his mother tried to persuade him, saying that it was rare for a commoner to be recruited as a royal guard at the age of 12, and that he would make history. His father supported her, saying that it would open up more opportunities for his future, and that he might even be granted nobility. But Tenma still said no, and the king asked him why he refused such an offer. Tenma said he had no interest in being a bodyguard because he wanted to stay with his family as much as possible. The king said he understood and respected his decision. He said he couldn't force him to do something he didn't want to do. Now, it was time for the king to investigate the Elder Forest. The king and his men, along with Ricardo, ventured into the Elder Forest. After an hour of walking, the king wondered if there was anything strange going on in the forest. Ricardo informed him that nine rank B monsters and two rank A monsters had been spotted within 50 kilometers of the village in the last few years. The king was shocked and asked what happened to the rank A monsters. Ricardo said they were both dead and that they were farriers. The king realized that Tenma had their baby, and Ricardo confirmed that the baby was Shiro, also known as Shiromaru. Meanwhile, at home, Chris played with Shiro using a bone. One of the king's men opened a book and started questioning Celia, writing down her answers. He asked Celia if people got medical treatment at the church, the mayor's house, or her house. Celia said yes, but it was rare since most ailments could be healed with magic. The officer nodded 
and said that the village had faced many challenges in the past few years, with more people falling ill and more monsters appearing nearby. Celia agreed and said that illness had increased two to three times in the past four to five years and that people had seen monsters like goblins and slimes near the forest. She said that most of the people who fell ill had some contact with the monsters, either by visiting the forest or by fighting them. The king concluded that there was a high possibility that something suspicious was happening in the forest itself and said that he would inform the mangrave so they could cooperate with the local government. The king thanked everyone for their hard work and expressed his gratitude to Ricardo and Celia for their cooperation. Three months later, Tenma rushed home, shouting for his mom. He said that he had gathered a ton of herbs and his mom praised him for collecting so many. She said that it must have been hard to gather so much and Tenma smiled and said it was a piece of cake. A lot had changed in the past few months. The mangrave had built a garrison near the village and sent soldiers and doctors there. That should have been a good thing, but it was not. The soldiers at the garrison restricted access to the area where the best medicinal herbs grew. They also took some of the herbs for themselves and sold them for pocket money. Because of the soldiers, the villagers lost access to the herbs, and Tenma was put in charge of using his fly magic to gather herbs for the village. The soldiers stopped Tenma and said that his family had been getting a lot of herbs lately. Tenma tried to ignore them, but they got angry and said that he had no right to ignore them. They tried to grab him, but Tenma easily defeated them using one of his special moves, the Descendant Decimator. After that, he went on to gather ingredients for food from the restricted area. That night, Tenma made a big delicious dinner for his whole family. Even his grandpa was amazed and asked him how he managed to make such food. His father said that the food looked delicious, and Tenma told them that he found some mountain yams and quails. His father tasted the fried quail and said that it was amazing. He said that he was impressed by how well Tenma grated the yams to go with the rice. Things in the village had changed, but it did not matter to Tenma as long as his family was with him. Here in the other world, every day with them was filled with happiness. Tenma thought that those days would last forever, but tragedy struck a mere month later in the form of goblins turned into zombies. And they were not ordinary zombies, they moved with purpose. It was clear that someone or something was controlling them. One of the soldiers who had escaped the danger had told them to warn them, saying that there were at least a hundred zombies. He said the zombies would reach the village in a matter of days. The representative of the soldier met with the leadership of the village right away, and they decided to evacuate to the nearest village. Then, they would wait for support from the mangrave. They were going to flee at first light the next day. However, the carriages were gone, and they wondered who took them. But on checking the garrison, they saw it was empty, and the soldiers had taken everything. Then, someone shouted Ricardo's name, saying that they were in trouble because a group of zombies was approaching the village. At that moment, they realized that the soldiers must have lied to them, using them as bait to escape. Ricardo told everyone to retreat to the garrison, saying that since they did not have carriages and supplies, trying to escape was pointless because women and children would not make it. Merlin encouraged the villagers, saying to them not to worry because the great sage was on their side and so they would be fine. The villagers took comfort in the fact that the great sage, Ricardo and Celia would be protecting them. Merlin said to Ricardo and Celia that the fight would be tough because the soldiers had lied to them about the zombies, that the zombies would be at least a thousand in number. He said they had no choice but to fight them. Then, Ricardo turned to Tenma and said he wanted him to fly ahead to the city. The soldiers who had fled were heading to. But Tenma asked how his father would fight without him. His father told him not to worry, telling him to fly over to the city and take his old guild card so that he could be given an audience and then ask for their help. Tenma collected the card and his father said he was counting on him because he was the only one who could perform the task. Tenma said okay, telling his dad not to worry. Merlin gave the signal to Celia and Ricardo, who unleashed a firestorm on the hordes of zombies. The flames burned many of the undead, but some survived and charged at Ricardo and his men. They drew their swords and fought valiantly, defeating all the monsters that had entered the village. Ricardo thought to himself that they needed a break to eat and regain their stamina. He wondered if they had enough food and weapons to survive another wave of zombies. Meanwhile, Tenma was flying back to the village after convincing the guild to help. 
The process had taken too long, and he knew it would be nighttime soon. He had to hurry. Ricardo used a tool to scan the area for more zombies, and he saw a larger group than before. He felt a surge of fear. Tenma arrived at the village and saw his father waiting for him. His father hugged him and asked if he was okay. Tenma assured him that he was fine and that the guild was sending help. It would take a whole day for them to get there, though. His father worried how they would hold out for that long. He praised his son for doing a great job and bringing back the supplies and food that he had recovered from the soldiers. The rest of the soldiers were encouraged by Tenma's resources and hoped they could make it through. One of the soldiers pointed out something in the distance and told the others to look. They saw orcs and dragon snakes that had been turned into zombies. They looked terrifying. Tenma told everyone to get inside the garrison and asked his father what the plan was. Tenma said he wanted to test something, but he wasn't sure if it would work. He had to try it, though. He used a firestorm spell, and his father yelled that it wouldn't do anything. Tenma then used wind magic to fuel the storm and make it stronger. Merlin watched him and marveled at his genius. Tenma was furious and vowed to burn all the zombies to ashes. He launched another fire tornado at the zombies, and they were all amazed by his power. Tenma waited for the fire to die down before he shot another one. But then, a ball of fire came from the flames and hit the garrison, injuring Tenma's hand and Ricardo's leg. Ricardo had shielded Celia from the blast, and she cried as she tried to heal him. Tenma looked at his father and was terrified by his injuries. His eyes widened with horror. Celia couldn't stop her tears from flowing. Tenma rushed to his father's side, but then he heard a loud roar. He and Merlin looked at the zombies and saw a giant dragon among them. It was also a zombie. It roared again and charged at them with great ferocity. Its eyes burned with fire. The arrival of a zombie dragon comes as a surprise to everyone. The dragon, which is an old dragon, is the highest level of the dragon species. Merlin explains that this is the reason why the other zombies are so powerful, and the zombies will not stop until they have defeated the zombie dragon. When he looks around, he notices that everyone is either injured or exhausted, and he wonders how they are going to kill the dragon. Tenma then performs total recovery power on everyone around him, and they begin to heal. His grandfather begs him to stop being irresponsible, since he would not survive if he continued to spend all of that power. Tenma does not pay attention and continues to emit magic. He looks at his father, who is still bleeding, and asks why he is still bleeding. At that moment, the dragon releases a second shot, which causes everyone to be terrified. While Tenma is claiming that he is almost finished with his recuperation, Ricardo advises him to stop and get out of there. However, Tenma's mother also encourages him to stop himself. She instructs him to let them go, and that he will be okay after Tenma asks her why she told him to stop. Merlin makes use of his magic to send Tenma far away from them as the undead dragon attacks once again. Tenma refuses, stating that they have always been together and that he does not want to leave them. He watches from a distance as the dragon fire consumes his family and the village. With a heavy heart, he makes the decision to die along with his family because he does not see any sense in continuing to live. However, just as he is ready to go to the dragon, he recalls that his family had asked him to stay alive. When he recalls them telling him that he is the only person they can trust, he becomes even more heartbroken and inquires as to why he is going through anything of that nature. He adores the fact that his family is rigorous yet gentle, and at that moment, he makes the decision to not disappoint them because of the wonderful life they have provided for him. When Tenma confronts the zombie dragon, he uses his physical strengthening ability. They engage in combat, and both of them give their best effort. The dragon strikes Tenma with a powerful blow, but Tenma, who is determined to get retribution for his family, decides that he will not die and that he will not allow the dragon to strike him twice. Tanma then decides to blast off the dragon, and he will not stop until he does it, even if it kills him. He begins his assault on the dragon by using an earth pillar and an air cutter. After that, he uses max power to chop off the head of the dragon. But the dragon develops another head. After that, he tells the dragon that he will give it everything he has, with all of his might. He then, with all of his strength, calls on his Tempest skill, which succeeds in destroying the dragon. He then feels relieved and names the dragon a rotten thorn. As Tenma is falling, he thinks about his family and says that he has done everything he could and that he is finished. Tenma is experiencing a loss of awareness, and he is pondering whether or not he is going to pass away. He hears someone calling his name, and he looks up to see the god of creation. 
She comments that she is relieved that he has remembered her after such a long time. Tenma inquires about the village residents who perished at the hands of the dragon, including his grandfather, father, and mother. The god of creation apologizes and says that she cannot bring back people who have died, but he is still barely alive and he is under their protection, so he shouldn't die there. She tells him that she came to help him because she is certain that he is going to die, and she is aware that this is unreasonable, but she can't let him die like that. Tenma recalls that she touches him and tells him that she does not want him to die and that he should live. She also reminds him that this is what his family wants for him. Tenma awakens to find Shiromaru licking his face. He also notices slime and inquires as to whether or not they are hunting him. He then sits down and pets Shiromaru, wondering how much time has passed, but his Fenrir appear to be unable to comprehend his thoughts. Tenma is astonished and confused about whether or not it is a monster, just a fish, or a mysterious creature. He wants to use the air cutter, but the fish urges him to wait because he's not the enemy. Soon after, a fish swims up and says that children must be more lively. It then wonders what is going on. He then introduces himself as Namitaro. Namitaro asks if Tenma is also reincarnated like him. He says he has never talked to anyone before, including his last life. Tenma says he has never talked to fish, and Namitaro asks him what he is doing there. Tenma explains his situation, and the fish feels sorry for him. He tells Tenma that he must have had a difficult time in Kukuri village. Tenma asks him if he knows what happened in the village, and he says that he heard from the birds. He explains that it appears that the zombie horde has been gone for some time since their leader was defeated, and the villagers who have survived have taken refuge somewhere else. The reason that Tenma gives is that the Kukuri village is no longer in existence. Namitaro asks him what he will do, and he responds by saying that he will move to a nearby city or village for the time being. However, Namitaro tells him that this is not what he means. He is talking about what he's going to do with his life because he appears to have lost a lot of things, and he is concerned about his ability to move forward into the future. He explains that he thought he was strong, but in reality, he has always been spoiled and protected, so he wants to become strong enough to protect what is important to him, and he does not want to lose anything anymore. Tenma says that he does not know what to do, but one thing is certain, and that is that he will become stronger eventually. He apologizes and says that he was just dreaming about the past. One of the girls asks if he is crying, but he says that he is not crying. He reasons that the new friends he has met wherever he goes will be protected by his own power. Tenma wakes up to three cat girls calling his name in the forest. One of the girls declares that she has been calling him for quite some time. Dozel, the proprietor of the Full Belly Inn in Gunjo City, serves Tenma breakfast one morning. He tells Tenma that he has an unusual eating style because of the way he blends the meals. Tenma is staying at the Full Belly Inn. After Tenma parted ways with Namataro, he went on a tour of a number of cities and villages. At the moment, he is a frequent visitor at the inn, and he is staying there because he enjoys the town and the people who live there. He adds that he thought he should go register at the guild, and Dazla asks why now, after all the time he has been in the city. Tenma answers that he has been thinking about a lot of things, and if there is any decent job, he will accept it immediately. Dazla asks if there is any reason why he is up earlier than normal. Tenma responds that he has been thinking about a lot of things. As Tenma walks around the city with Shiromaru, the people look surprised, even though there is a collar on his name that says he is tame. He tells Shiromaru to wait outside the guild building, and those who are outside rush over to pet him. Tenma's reasons for registering are straightforward. He wants to become stronger so that he can protect his friends. Three young women who go by the names of Millie, Lily, and Nellie welcome Tenma as soon as he enters the building. They inquire as to whether he is registering and encourage him to accept a position with them. He tells them that he will determine whether or not the job is a good one, but they add that he always rejects them. The Catgirl sisters are adventurers of level C. Tenma rescued them from two ogres when he first arrived in the city. Since then, they have developed a fondness for him, and he is sure that seeing him slay a monster of rank B was an impressive experience for them. Tenma is provided with a form to fill out, and after considering the information that he is required to provide, which includes his main, age, magic ability, followers, criminal background, and a great deal more, he makes the decision to leave out his most powerful spells. He is surprised that he is starting out at rank D rather than E, and the vice guild master Flute explains that he has defeated many monsters that were rank C and above, so they decided that there would be no problem starting him out at rank D. Additionally, the man warns him that there will be a replacement fee, so he should try not to lose it. After he has finished filling out the form, he is given his guild card. 
They tease that it will be dangerous to babysit a kid and that they are super strong. The sisters refuse, but the men insist that Tenma will be useless to them. They say that he is just trying to mooch off of them and that he is nothing more than a filthy parasite. The cat girl sisters tell him that they should hurry up and get a job, but an adventurer prevents them from doing so and tells them to forget about Tenma and join their party instead. Tenma explains that in his previous life, dashboards were comparable to giant boars. The sisters explain that several dashboards have been destroying fields and causing damage to crops. Tenma suggests that they should go for it, and the sisters enthusiastically agree. The sisters tell them that they do not know what they are talking about. They then leave and choose a mission to defeat some dashboards. All of them head to the store to get various antidotes and potions. The girls also go to the store to purchase snacks, which amazes Tenma. After that, they go to dine at a restaurant, and he leads them back to their house. The adventurers, who want the cat girl sisters to join their group, stop Tenma as he is traveling home. They tell him that they have been waiting for him, and he asks them what they want because he has observed that they have been following him. Tenma reminds them that the three sisters had repeatedly rejected them, but the men say they do not care, and they will make them warm up to them. They make light of the fact that they will only need to pinch them slightly to get them to behave and joke that they can train them to behave like cats. Additionally, the adventurer tells him that he should let them have the quest that he took on with the triplets because he is not yet a man enough to handle them. The men then tell him that they can let him have his turn once they get tired of them, but he will have to be patient until then. Tenma, who has become enraged by all of their remarks, approaches the leader and is about to punch him when he changes his mind and smashes the man to the ground. After that, those guys never bothered the triplets again. On their way to the village, the triplets ask themselves how far it is to the village and one of the sisters suggests that they should arrive there before sundown. The following morning, the triplets catch up with Tenma and apologize for being late. Tenma informs them that he has something good with him, and then pulls out a carriage from his bag. The girls appear shocked, and he explains that the bag is a dimension bag built with time-space magic, which means that they can put anything in it. He also reveals that Rocket, his slime, and Shiramaru enjoy staying inside the bag. The sisters inquire as to whether Tenma will pull the carriage, but he pulls out a massive box from his bag and transforms it into a golem that resembles a horse. He then announces that this is the golem that will pull the carriage. The sisters appear excited and inquire about the name of the golem. He responds that the golem's name is Valley Wind, and they proceed with their journey to the village. They ask Tenma how the golem moves, and he tells them that it is complicated. In reality, Valley Wind is powered by a zombie dragon magical core, and after Tenma killed it, Rocket collected a fragment of it for him. The girls are surprised that they saw the village from a distance, and they are surprised that they arrived there faster than they had planned. Tenma explains that because the golem was constructed from the core of an ancient dragon, it is significantly more powerful than a golem made of dirt or stone. This is the reason why people are always surprised when they see it. The sisters insist that he tell them how the golem moves, but Tenma is adamant about keeping that information to himself. They are fortunate enough to arrive at the residence of their client, who happens to be the mayor of the village. Banza, the mayor, explains that several dashboards appeared a week ago and began destroying their fields. He claims that the dashboards come out at night to eat the vegetables. A maid arrives with tea, but she appears to be scared and fidgeting as her teacup falls from her tray just as she is about to serve Tenma. Tenma apologizes profusely and assures her that it is okay. He then asks Banza to show them the field, and then they all leave the house. As soon as they arrive at the field, Tenma expresses his desire to explore the area. Banza informs him that he is going to return home and inquires about the possibility of them joining him for dinner. Tenma declines, stating that they would camp out on the field and Banza goes back home by himself when the cat girl sisters show Tenma some dashboard footprints that they have seen. They express their relief at being there with him. They remark that if they had gone alone, there is no way that they would have been able to take on all of the dashboards. Tenma says that they need to make some adjustments to their approach. The girls claim that he can take care of the dashboards in no time, but he adds that they will need more numbers, so he will construct some golems, and he will require each of them to give him a strand of their hair. Tenma makes the suggestion that they adapt their strategy. The girls are taken aback and wonder what he is doing with their hair. He reminds them that he has stated that he wants to create golems, and they give him a strand of their hair. He then uses his magical abilities to create the golem, and they subsequently sit down to eat. Once they have finished eating, he informs them that it is almost time for them to begin, and he inquires as to whether or not they are prepared. They respond that they are prepared, 
and he then instructs them to begin their plan. While this is going on, at the mayor's residence, Banza's guard informs him that the adventurers are now standing guard. He then instructs the man to inform the others that it is time for them to make a move. Banza then instructs the man to follow the plan, which is to kill the kid and capture the three females while they are still unconscious. Banza men arrive in the forest and see Tenma and one of the girls on watch. They come to the conclusion that the other two girls must be inside the carriage. They call the other two girls fools for thinking that some dashboards are going to come when, in fact, they are the ones that are coming. Their leader reminds them that they have the ability to kill Tenma, but that they should capture the girls without causing any damage to them, because demi-humans are highly valued. The men attack the two sitting outside and stab Tenma, but they get no reaction from him. They are surprised and wonder what he is, but what they stabbed is not Tenma, but his golem. The golem retaliates and kicks the man who stabbed him. They also notice that the carriage is empty, but before they could process what was wrong, the three sisters arrived and attacked them. Before the assault, Tenma instructs the sisters to provide him with a strand of their hair so that he can create a golem. He explains that because he is creating golems from their hair, magical stones, and earth, he is able to replicate them from their hair. This means that their beginnings will be the same, as will the bodies that he creates, as well as their physiques and characteristics. Despite the fact that the golems are ready, they are naked. Tenma apologizes, saying that he completely forgot to put on clothes. However, the sisters accuse him of being a pervert and advise him to exercise self-control, despite the fact that he is a teenage guy. Back in the fight, the sisters' golem uses swords, bows, and arrows to attack Banza men and kills them easily. The real sisters who are watching are surprised that the golems can move just like them and even know their combos in fighting too. They look at Tenma's golem and notice that it has killed the man who stabbed it. Banza, who is waiting at a distance, observes that the field has become quiet. He detects someone behind him and tells that person to go check out what is happening on the field. However, the person approaches Banza and asks him why he is not going to go himself. Banza gets furious and says, how can the person speak to him in such a manner? However, he turns around to see Tenma and he appears shocked. He then asks Tenma how he arrived there and whether or not his men were unsuccessful. When Banza responds that a youngster like him cannot be serious, Tenma hits him and causes him to fall to the ground. Banza then adds that he knew the guys in the village were not genuine residents from the beginning, and that includes himself. Tenma then tells him that his men are unconscious and asks where the real locals are. He made his soldiers appear to be villagers. He held the young women captive and made them his slaves, and he asked him once more where the other villagers were. Tenma adds that any adventurer will become suspicious of a town that only has women, so he kept them captive and made them his slaves. Banza is standing there with a knife concealed behind his back. He remarks that if Tenma has figured out that much, then he ought to be aware that he has killed all of them. Banza then makes an attempt to stab Tenma with the knife that he is concealing, but Tenma uses his magical power to cut off his hand. Tenma tells Banza that this is not all and he asks him how many villagers he killed, as well as whether he should cut off his right arm or his left leg, or if he should cut him once for every person he murdered. Banza hurriedly begs for mercy, but Tenma warns him that this is not all. Banza falls to the ground in agony since his arm has been severed. Tenma and the sisters bind Banza and his men, and he suggests that they should bring them back to town and deliver them up to the guild. He also suggests that they should take the girls from the hamlet with them. The sisters comment, that they will require another carriage, but they can use the bandit's carriage instead. Tenma really understood right away that the men were phony when he checked their statuses, but he did not want to inform the sisters that he had discovered that it was a trap. When the sisters asked him when he realized it was a trap, he said that it was when he spotted the tracks of the dashboard. Flute, who has been worried, rushes out to meet them when they return to the guild. He claims that he heard some bandits attack them while they were on their quest, but Tenma explains what actually occurred. The guild is after Banza's gang of bandits, according to Flute, and they have a sizable bounty on their heads. However, he never expected that they would take over an entire village, and he apologizes for the fact that they did not do enough research to get themselves into that situation. Tenma tells the knights that he is the leader of the party, but the men do not believe him. They say that even a child can be punished for making a false statement. Tenma tells them that he is not lying and even shows them that the Cat Sisters are his party. The knights arrive and ask who is responsible for arresting the bandits. Tenma tells them that he is the leader of the party. After a lady enters and urges them to quit making a spectacle of themselves because that is not how a knight behaves, the men appear to become more agitated. 
They remark that a young child and three cat girls are unable to capture Bonza and his entire company because they have escaped them for such a long time. Primera, the lady who serves as the captain of the fourth unit of the Gunjo City Knights, has stated that the Knights ought to feel ashamed of themselves for the behavior that they have displayed. When Tenma arrived in the city, he informed Flute that he had successfully apprehended Bonza and his entire group of bandits who were wanted criminals. The guild then contacted the Knights, who settled on the decision that he should receive the reward money. However, when the Knights arrived to confirm their decision, they began to criticize him, claiming that he could not have been responsible for the capture. Primera then apologizes to Tenma for the rudeness of her subordinates, and they identify themselves with each other. Primera then asks Tenma whether he is indeed the one who brought down the wicked gang. The knights apologize to Primera, and the cat girl sisters are startled to learn that she is their captain. Primera then apologizes to Tenma for this. Tenma says he does not know what to say to convince her, and then all of a sudden, Shiromaru comes out of the dimension bag, which amazes everyone. She comments that she guesses she shouldn't truly judge a book by its cover. In the course of Tenma's explanation that Shiromaru is his Fenrir follower, and the demonstration of the proof that he has been tamed, Primera is taken aback by the fact that he has a monster of rank A as a follower. Tenma assures her that Shiromaru is fluffy and not dangerous, so she can pet him. Her colleagues shout that she should not touch the Fenrir because he may try to set his monster on her, but he merely continues to stroke Shiromaru and tells her that he is extremely fluffy. Tenma informs her that Shiromaru is not harmful. Primera appears to have a strong desire to pet Shiromaru, but as she is stretching her hamstrings to do so, she quickly reminds herself to be careful and informs Tenma that they have confirmed the capture of the bandits, which means that his reward will be sent to him in a few days. She then departs with her knights, but she appears to have a strong desire to pet or otherwise interact with Shiromaru. Tenma gets raised to rank C, and he inquires of Flute whether or not it is simple to progress. Flute responds by explaining that she informed the guildmaster about Banza capture, which is the reason why he is formally approved for rank advancement. Following Tenma's collection of his guild card and expression of gratitude to Flute, who then makes a special request of him, Flute explains that theoretically, he ought to be ranked B due to all of his accomplishments. The objective is to vanquish a bird-like monster known as a rock bird. Rock birds have bodies that are as tough as rocks and wingspans that are greater than three meters. In addition, rock birds are known to be very skilled flyers, which can make the task challenging. Flute adds that the birds dwell on a mountain that is far away from any of the villages. Therefore, there have not been any victims, but the guild cannot just let them go free. Tenma sees that the request does not have any payment specified. Flute explains that the birds are not just one bird, but an entire flock. As a result of her statement that Tenma will be compensated per bird and that he will be allowed to keep any spoils from the combat, Tenma agrees to fulfill the request. Tenma uses Valley Wind to travel to the mountain, and when he sees the mountain where the rock birds are, he tells Valley Wind that he cannot go any farther and puts him back in the bag. After that, he uses detection to figure out where the birds are located. After that, he flies up to where they are and uses an air bullet to shoot some of the birds. He believes that if he waits for the appropriate moment, it will not be difficult for him to take them down. Tenma is able to kill a large number of birds later on, and while he is packing them and their eggs, a group of men stop him and warn him that he has a lot of spoils with him. They tell him to drop them, but Tenma does not listen to them. Instead, he continues packing the spoils and thinks about the supper that he will prepare with them. As the men become enraged, they attempt to assault him, but he is able to simply tie them down together and then depart after packing his belongings. Tenma comments that the amount of money seems excessive, and Primera adds that the payment for capturing Banza is also included. Primera then enters the room and also states that she has handed Flute the reward for capturing Banza. Flute then compliments Tenma and hands him the award. The individuals who attempted to obstruct Tenma at the mountain barge into the guild building and claim that Tenma stole the rock bird from them. Flute inquires as to whether or not this is true, and he answers that it is not. Then, Flute asks their leader how they were able to beat the rock birds. The leader responds that they were able to do so by using a bow. Flute, however, reveals that the rock birds didn't have any arrow wounds on their bodies, and that a direct blow to the head using magic killed them. Primera, who has been watching since then, reveals that she is the third daughter of Duke Sanga. The man asks her in a furious manner if she is labeling him a liar and he claims that his father is a titled noble with connections to Duke Sangha. 
Primera has been watching since then. Her question is, how dare a thief like him claim to be a noble and name drop a duke? She then goes on to say that the consequence for such an act is harsh, and she instructs her knights to remove him from the premises. Primera apologizes to Tenma for the troubles she has been having with the man. Shiramaru appears out of the bag, but just as she is about to touch him, the knights remind her that they need to return as soon as possible. She leaves feeling disappointed that she has not yet had the opportunity to touch Shiramaru. Tenma is overjoyed that he has finally been able to prepare a flan dish. However, because there is no refrigerator in the inn, he had to use magic to freeze the flan. When some of the men at the inn saw the flan, they commented that it had a strange form. They inquired as to whether it was some type of egg, and Tenma asked them if they would like to sample it. During the time that they are enjoying the food, Tenma is thinking about the various meals that he can prepare now, such as donuts, pancakes, and crepes. He then goes to the guild, where he meets Flute, and he tells her that he has a gift for her, and he gives her some donuts that he has cooked. He explains that he created too many donuts, so he decided she should share them with everyone. He then reveals that it is a treat called donuts, and everyone appreciated it, which makes Tenma happy, and she wants to make more. Flute has never seen a donut before because it is not recognized on their planet. In light of the fact that he will be confronted by a water monster, he decides to go shopping and selects a request that asks him to kill crocodile sharks. He then proceeds to look through the other requests that are available. While he is on his way to the store, he becomes aware that three individuals are observing him. He turns around and sees the Catgirl sisters, who question him about why he did not provide them with donuts. Subsequently, he spends the majority of the day preparing donuts. The following day, Tenma travels to the lake where the crocodile sharks are located. He makes use of detection to determine the precise location of the sharks, and he is able to locate one with relative ease. He then prepares the bait that he intends to use, which consists of rockbird meat, strong chains, and a large hook. He has doubts about his ability to accomplish the task, but he immediately convinces himself that it is between him and the shark so he can do it. He then sets the trap, and the shark swiftly bites into it. He then begins to drag the chain, but the shark is too heavy for him to do so. Finally, he employs Shockwave, which defeats the shark with ease. Although he had seen several other crocodile sharks, it seemed that the blast scared them away. He makes the decision to use detection once more. But then he observes a shadow in the water extremely close to Shiramaru, who is eating a fish that he caught in the lake. Tenma is not close to them, so he is unable to quickly stop the shark from attacking Shiramaru while he is still eating the fish. However, Shiramaru uses his paw to stop the crocodile shark from attacking him. Tenma praises Shiramaru for his strength, but he suddenly falls into a hole, and Tenma rescues him. In the end, they go back to their house. Tenma and Shiramaru are both covered in blood, and Primera suddenly arrives and asks him if he is okay. Because of the blood on them, many people are terrified of them as they return to the inn. He asks her what she is doing there, and she tells him that they had a report of a young kid who was covered in blood and traveling through the city with a monster. Tenma is astonished that he was reported and he explains that they are not injured and that they merely experienced some problems in their journey. After that, Primera focuses on Shiramaru, and she expresses her concern for him because his fur is covered in blood. Tenma tells Primera that they are going to return to the inn so that he can give Shiramaru a bath, and he will also clean up. Primera then inquires as to whether or not she may assist him. Primera has a good time bathing Shiramaru as she gets petted and touches him. Tenma says that he feels bad about having the night captain help him with that kind of chore, but she says that it is her job to solve problems when they get reports. She quickly clarifies that she means that she wants to help with Shiramaru's bath after shocking Tenma with her question. He readily agrees, and the two of them go to the inn together. As Tenma emerges from his own bath, he contemplates the manner in which he ought to compensate Primera for the assistance she has provided. As he emerges from the bath, he makes the decision to prepare donuts for Primera. Upon exiting the bath, he is shocked to see Primera still present and petting Shiromaru.